Um, now it's my very great pleasure um, to introduce uh, Laura Truy, who um, is from the Zooniverse project. This is an amazing project. If you guys haven't looked at any other citizen science projects, make sure you look at this one and Julia's, which follows. Um, the Zooniverse platform is used by, I think, hundreds of projects across the world, as Laura's going to tell you. Um, and is an amazing development. But let me tell you a little bit about Laura. Um, Laura is, um, she got her PhD uh, in astrophysics in 2010, studying galaxy evolution. Uh, she's also been strongly involved in education research. She has uh, received um, awards for that. She is the co-PI for Zooniverse and the senior director of citizen science at the Adler Planetarium where she leads Zooniverse web development and team, teen, teen and probably team projects um, using Zooniverse. She is also a research associate at Northwestern University and she has many other um, accolades even though she's so early clearly in her career and she's doing amazing work. So welcome Laura. Thank you for that kind introduction. Um, <clears throat> so my hope through this talk is just in part to answer the question that was asked right before is, is to convey how exciting this moment is at the frontiers of citizen science for researchers as well as for the public and to highlight all the ways this is an amazing sandbox um, with which to explore um, the topics that we've been covering over the past two days, so design choices, cybernetics, data visualizations. My hope is to inspire the artists in the room to look to citizen science for inspiration, uh, the computer scientists to recognize the depth of opportunities um, that are available in this realm, and the data scientists to want to apply their exploration tools to this context. I'll first focus on the human side of discovery, uh, we'll then dive into the current state of human-machine integration. You'll see a slight change in the title from the program that might have been posted. Um, and then we'll head out into the Wild West together, so where humans and machines play together, recognizing and capitalizing on each other's strengths. So Zooniverse and all that I'll describe is possible because of the team of developers, designer, handful of researchers, and our collaborations with hundreds of researchers around the world. It was also key in our creation 10 years ago to partner between the Adler Planetarium, an expert in engaging the public in science, and Oxford, an expert in research and data. Um, that's the foundation on which all of the rest of this can grow. So over the past 10 years, Zooniverse has grown to 1.6 million registered volunteers from 234 countries, five-year-olds to 95-year-olds, participating in over 80 active projects across the disciplines. These projects have led to over 140 peer-reviewed publications and enormous impacts on their fields of research. Our recent accelerated expansion is due to our free project builder tool. Um, so we went from launching five projects in 2015 to 26 projects in 2016 to 40 in 2017. So anyone can build their own Zooniverse project for free with our browser-based tools. So each Zooniverse project has a classification interface with an image, video, or audio file, and some data processing stat task. So here are just a few example slides to illustrate. About a quarter of our projects are ca camera, traps, camera trap uh, projects of this type. So in the first three days of Snapshot Serengeti launching, uh, our volunteers processed a backlog of 18 months of data uh, by providing several million classifications. Each image was tagged by 25 people, and then researchers used the consensus result in their, uh, in their research. The consensus result provides, in this project, a 97% accuracy compared to expert classifications. And in the 3% where they don't agree, even the experts don't agree with themselves about half the time. About a quarter of our projects are astronomy projects with question tasks and marking tasks. Um, here, 15 people identify and mark surface features on each of the tens of thousands of Martian terrain images. For example, these spider features provide clues into Mars's weather, weather patterns. Over the past five to 10 years, museums, archives, libraries, 
um, galleries, we've created huge collections of digitized images. But until they're tagged with the metadata needed and or they're fully transcribed, they're not searchable data. Uh, they're not truly unlocked. And so as a result, there's a huge demand for metadata tagging and transcription projects like this one. Here, volunteers transcribe the correspondences between William Lloyd Garrison and his network of abolitionists. We just launched this project a few weeks ago. So for all Zooniverse projects to date, the researchers set the primary classification task. This is how they enable the discovery of the known knowns, uh, tracking predator-prey relationships in the Serengeti, understanding weather patterns on Mars, carrying out a network analysis for the anti-slavery movement, and so on. The ability to discover the known knowns through crowdsourcing data processing steps is huge, um, especially when coupled with machine learning, as I'll describe later. This is how we unlock key areas of research. But humans' ability to recognize patterns is much more sophisticated than just this first step. What makes us truly special is our ability to recognize the weird and the unusual and say, hey, that is bizarre. Um, so with so many eyes on the data and with the right design and supportive culture, we also enable discovery of the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns. Key to this step is that each project has a dedicated uh, discussion forum, which we refer to as talk, and often a blog and other social media. So one example of a discovery of a known unknown is the presence of Zerilla in the Serengeti. So unfortunately, this is not the love child of a zebra and a gorilla. How fun would that be? But, um, but rather this little skunk-like creature. Um, only by having tens of thousands of eyes on the millions of snapshot Serengeti images were the volunteers able to find uh, this image and a small handful more um, of these Zerilla. And only through the discussion forum were they able to say, hey, this is neat, this is different, and not on the original list of expected species. While rangers had thought they'd had sightings of Zerilla, a population in the Serengeti had never been documented in a robust way. So across the projects, there are important discoveries of this known unknown type. And then there are the discoveries of the unknown unknowns. So as an astronomer, my background is in black holes, um, but I think also just as a human, these are what we really dream about. It's the frontier, the edge, the completely unexpected. Um, you may have seen the headlines, so citizen scientists discover aliens, um, and artist renditions of this type of an alien megastructure and a star. Uh, it's the story of the WTF star, which uh, is a lovely name, or Tabby's star. Um, it's, the, it's a Kepler space satellite star with this very weird light curve. And so WTF is actually related to the title, but we all know what it refers to. Um, <laughs> The leading idea now is that the strange light curve is due to a dusty ring around the star, but it's, the tar it's been the target of a Kickstarter-funded ongoing observing campaign because it's so unusual. It defies our understanding and doesn't fit into our existing theories. For this talk, though, what I want to highlight is the volunteer-led nature of this discovery of this unknown unknown. So Daryl LaCourse, who's the second author listed on this um, peer-reviewed article, is a Zooniverse volunteer who made this discovery possible and opened up this new research thread. So after classifying the light curve in Planet Hunters, Daryl noted in the discussion forum, this is strange, worth a closer look. It intrigued him, and this is one of my favorite posts in all of our talk discussion forums. He wonders, he shares his ideas, and I really like the last line below the figure. He says, this is a good opportunity to rampantly speculate in paint. Um, and that's what we do as researchers. We put up straw dog ideas and we invite discussion. And key is to have a deliberate design and supportive community culture so that people feel they can publicly speculate, make mistakes, be wrong, and move the conversation forward in collaboration with the research team. Having fresh eyes, and particularly a diverse set of eyes, allows us, and more so it forces us, to look at our data in a different way and engage in ideas. It's important to note here that our researchers are embedded within an academic culture from which I come, which often fails to be supportive, opening, and welcoming of this type. And so an open question is how best to support researchers in creating a better research environment with their citizen scientist partners from around the world acknowledging cultural differences in discourse and engagement, in hierarchy and in authority. Creating that comfort level to be curious publicly is one of the major barriers to discovery. 
So, so far I've focused on the human side of our system and our special capacity to discover. However, with our massive data sets, with both high rates and volumes of data coming in, it's neither through human effort alone nor through machine effort alone that we'll be able to handle this onslaught of data. The frontiers of online citizen science is in the integration of human and machine classification efforts. So now a request to the artists in the audience, please create a better visual uh, for the integration of humans and machines. <laughs> Uh, one that's less ominous, more representative of the optimism and opportunity that this really brings us. Um, this one is a little bit better, but I wish they weren't facing away from one another. Um, so I hope the next few slides will provide you inspiration, and then please send them my way. Um, so first, an overview of the simplest version of this system. So data comes in, for example, from the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. It's a next generation telescope that will come on online in the next couple years. LSST is an all-sky imaging effort and will ge generate 40 terabytes of data every night and a million alerts of objects of interest every day. So first, automated routines will categorize most of the known object types like normal galaxies, asteroids, stars. Unusual events and unclassifiable objects will be sent to citizen scientists who will discover, who will discover the unusual and the rare, like I've talked about, as well as provide more training data for the machines. And together, the system drives towards more knowledge um, and further discovery. So to understand the immense impact on efficiency of such a human-machine system, we ran an experiment with a completed data set from Galaxy Zoo from 2010. So Galaxy Zoo was the first Zooniverse project asking volunteers to classify a galaxy as a spiral, an elliptical, a merger, or an artifact. And just that simple question then allowed the 40-plus Galaxy Zoo-based research publications that have come from that project. So there were 200,000 images in the second Galaxy Zoo data set. The x-axis shows um, the number of days that have gone by, and the y-axis shows the cumulative, cumulative number of retired subjects. The blue curve on the plot shows that at 100 days, Galaxy Zoo human volunteers had only classified about 50,000 images and retired them from the system. About 45 people look at every image. Um, it would take them more than a year, from 2010 to 2011, to classify the full data set. In contrast, the machine learning automated routine started training on day eight, with an initial training sample provided by the human effort. The machine was fully trained by day 12, and retired 70,000 of the subjects on that first application. So that's the abrupt increase in retired subjects in the red curve. By 30 days, the machine had retired the entire 200,000 plus data set. So that's over a factor of 10 increase in time, um, or decrease in time, compared to the 400 plus days it took humans to do it alone back in 2011. So in a longer talk, I would then describe our experiment within a supernova project to combine human-machine classifications together and finding that only the combination of the two provides the most complete and pure sample of supernova candidates. I would also describe our gravity spy system, uh, which is, uses machine classifications to train humans and then human classifications to train the machines uh, more fully. In, the in that context is the gravitational wave discoveries that have been occurring. So I'd be happy to speak more on those machine learning, human-machine efforts in the question period or after the talk. Instead, in this short talk, um, I wanted us to imagine how we could keep pushing the efficiency of the human-machine system. For one, we could just show humans the subjects machine learning is least confident with, or that just need verification, or just a particular cluster of types of objects. So while we could do this, uh, what makes this an extremely complicated um, and interesting but difficult problem is that humans are complicated and have their own motivations and wants and needs. So specifically, we know that the most efficient system can detract from volunteer engagement. A simple example of this came from uh, an experiment on blank images that we ran within the Snapshot Serengeti project. So blanks refer to images that don't have an animal present. My apologies to those who love grass and leaves. Um, but they're blinks in this context. So at first glance, we thought, great. If machine learning can remove all the blinks, uh, that'll be a more efficient system. But it turns out that volunteers will do more classifications of non-blank images if you include a certain fraction of blinks. So related, it's related to how slot machines work. 
If you see a lion as your first image, you're likely to leave the system. Uh, you'll leave the system soon because you've gotten your reward. If instead you classify eight blanks and then you see a lion, you'll stick around and do many more classifications of both blanks and non-blank images um, to get that reward again. So all to say that people are more complicated than machines, big surprise, and, uh, and we need to take into account their motivations and what engages a volunteer when thinking through how best to optimize the efficiency of a human-machine citizen science system. So this is a guiding principle in our design approach and will be the linchpin in doing this right and being able to handle the onslaught of data that we're facing. So connected with pushing the frontiers of machine learning in citizen science and optimizing engagement, um, we have come to recognize a fundamental limitation in our current conception of a subject in Zooniverse. So currently a subject is a single image or audio or video snippet. Each subject is completely independent from its context and broader data set. For example, in this project, Etchicel, 15 people draw the contour of the nucleus of this single slice of a three-dimensional cancer cell. And we do the same for the other thousand slices for that cell and the thousands of other cells in the data set. The researcher then takes uh, the consensus result for all of these individual slices and stacks them together to create the 3D nucleus for the cancer cell, for each cell. This is incredibly inefficient, as you're probably noticing. A major limitation of our system is that it does not recognize the data set as a whole. Each subject is completely separate, um, devoid of context and knowledge of its neighbors. So instead, we envision a true transformation from the bottom up of our infrastructure and an opening to a whole new universe of possibility. It would be a system that recognizes the full data cube and all related metadata for that subject. So this will revolutionize both the human experience as well as the possibilities available to human-machine interaction within the system. So in this Etchicel example, we'd enable an incredible gain in efficiency. Human classifications would provide the tracing for the first few slices, training and informing the machine learning that would then tra trace the next 10 or so with confidence. The moment the machine confidence wanes, human classifications would take over again. Um, and so on through the entire three-dimensional cell. Or in a conversation with Alyssa yesterday, instead we could have the automated routine do a first pass at marking the entire nuclear structure of the whole cell, and in augmented reality, human experience could then clean up the edges. So I didn't have a video of what that would look like, but this VR just of a clay sculpting experience is a helpful visual for what that, might, that experience could look like. So this reconception of a subject in our system would also enable a completely new um, type of data interactions and discovery pathways for our volunteers, which had, would have enormous impact in terms of the science and data literacy learning opportunities. So the image shows our current Exoplanet Explorers project. The task is a simple yes, no, is a planet present, but the subject, um, which is shown on the left, is among the most complex. It's also one of our more popular projects, despite this complexity in the subject. So the current interface displays a static image, and it happens to be a composite of static views of a single star's light changing over time. A periodic dip is an indicator of a planet passing in front of a distant star and blocking its light. In the next generation of our platform, these plots should be interactive, um, calling to mind several of the talks yesterday with interactions in one plot triggering, triggering changes in another. We also want to, the, to enable the overlay of additional information. For example, images of the star's environment at different moments in time across the light curve. A common false positive in the system is an asteroid passing or a glitch in the detector. And so these thumbnail images would enable quick dismissals by the volunteers of false positives. And in the moment when a volunteer thinks they see a true exoplanet, Imagine if they could immediately access all the data and metadata available about this star within this interface in order to dive straight into the exploration and analysis phase. It would be fascinating to experiment with what support and training we would need to provide to make as low a barrier to, um, to using this as possible um, to this type of interaction and what impact it would have on who participates in the discovery process. So now, uh, for the last just couple slides, something a little bit different. 
So I was inspired by the artists I spoke with yesterday, who are um, let me turn this on, who who are attending um, to rearrange my talk a little bit to highlight some of the artistic endeavors that Zooniverse has sparked. For example, the We Need Us um, uh, website is a live online animated artwork that listens to the Zooniverse API um, as classifications come through our Kinesis stream. So it moves from one project to the next, animating, and you don't hear the sound, but there's sound pings that go with each classification that occurs um, in reaction to that classification stream. And it's, it's fun to go to this site when a new project launches and just the cacophony of noise and sound that comes through. Um, another digital art example is work by a data visualization artist, Alexis Foucault, who... Um, which was based on our Gravity Spy project. Uh, Gravity Spy is shown on the right. Uh, this is a needle in a haystack type project with a human machine system working with gravitational wave researchers to categorize the noise in the system in order to strengthen their signal for real gravitational wave detections. Each, is, each of Alexis's renditions is a representation of one of the identified glitch types in the LIGO detector. The final example comes from our Planet 4 trains project, where the images of Mars' surface have um, just fantastic shapes and textures. So in this post, a Swiss volunteer shares um, their art, inspired by the Swiss cheese trains. So these are their paintings using acrylic, oil, and sand. And they're, they're, they're beautiful. Um, another is, um, so another Planet Four volunteer was inspired by Tennyson's um, Loxley Hall poem uh, to write his own verses on the arrival of the Martian spring. So in case it's too faint to read. In the spring, the sunrise heralds changes on the Martian ice. In the spring, a P4 classifier's fancy lightly turns to the thoughts of sublimation. Um, so these works of art are an incredibly important connection point for our volunteers and our researchers, and we know we've just scratched the surface of being able to tell the stories of this very human, human machine system. So with that, I just want to thank you all um, for the incredibly interesting conversations and ideas over the past two days. It's really an honor for me to be here. <laughs>